So welcome everybody. Uh, this is the session we're going to have next week with uh, Amali De Silva and Frederick Cohen as the invited guest speakers. It will be a 90 minute session, so keep that in mind and make sure you make uh, proper arrangements. I do want to remind you all that this will be the last session we're going to have, and after that, you have until Friday midnight or 2359 UTC to finish the course. Remember that you have to uh, mark as done the participant guidebook. You also have to accomplish an 80% minimum in each one of the quizzes, complete the survey at the end of the course, and then you will get your certificate of completion, which will be printed out, sent to you by email, and you'll be able to see it within the course. So having said that, uh, next uh, we have our invited guest speaker for today, which will explain he, I'll let him explain what happened, that he's all of a sudden in, this, in the queue as an invited guest speaker. And he's going to give us a, an overview of social and cultural issues, but from a particular perspective that I will let him uh, explain as he moves forward. Uh, Glenn, the floor is yours. Welcome. Great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm filling in for Han Nugent. Uh, she's the PhD student. And actually, I have her in the slides as a, an example of, of, of an intervention that she's doing in LA. So uh, as a result of that, she gave me um, notice that she was not able to attend today. So I put together this slideshow. So I hope it's uh, informative and entertaining for you. So welcome, everyone. And um, as we were saying in the chat before we started, some people are having difficulty getting in um, for a number of reasons, but one of the, the challenges is the uh, time zone differences. So welcome everyone. It's now uh, a few minutes past nine, so let's get started. So uh, I want to set the objectives of, of this uh, session. So I'm going to identify the problem, and it's a very, di very diverse problem. Uh, I want to talk about the classifications of groups identified on the wrong side of the digital divide. Isn't you know what's what's important is there isn't one overarching group. It's a diversity of different groups with different needs and wants. Um, talk briefly about government and non-government interventions to deal and come up with um, uh, resolutions on the problem, and an emphatic statement that there is no simple solution. Uh, of this problem, and I'll share with you a couple examples of, of uh, other types of technology that uh, in theory would solve a problem, but it doesn't necessarily do it, and uh, some resources and best practices, so uh, launching forward. Okay, so uh, I think we know that the, the scope of the problem of connectivity is is a huge one. We're talking 3.4 billion people, even though that we've reached uh, past the 50% mark, there still is a massive amount uh, uh, of numbers of people that are not connected. And what's most important is that 93% of this number of 3.4 billion are from low or medium income countries. So according to the ITU, they report that it would cost 428 billion to provide 10 megabytes broadband globally by 2020. Well, we're, um, I don't think we've seen that investment, but that uh, is something that, uh, that they speculate at what it would cost. Now, over 300 million, according to, and, and I'm getting this stat from Alex, I mean, she did the presentation at the Connecting the Unconnected uh, IEEE conference last week. And she stated there that only 300 million people have very high quality internet. And because it was a conference, she didn't provide any stats on that, but it's an interesting number to think about that you have in a massive uh, disparity between those who are have no connectivity at all to people who have super fast connectivity. So the disparity between the the hyper connected to the no connection is, is huge. Now, 
The challenge is fairly complex. It's not just availability of access. It's also very important is the affordability issues, uh, the relevance of, of the, the access, you know, can you live or live without it, and, and the readiness of the population to use the technology. Now, this is a very fast, you probably have seen this, this map. It just shows you uh, in the data as you go from uh, gray to the deepest blue, uh, countries that have the, the, uh, uh, the largest penetration of internet access. So you can see there's massive populations in the global south, particularly Africa and Asia and parts of, of uh, Latin America that have very slow internet. Now, what I have to point out is, is that the, from a Canadian perspective, there's a bit of um, misnomer there because the far north of Canada, and I'll talk about it in my slides, actually is not a deep blue at all. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. So carrying forward. So let's talk about economic impact of internet connectivity. I, I think we all know that broadband can help expand the risk of task-based work through online outsourcing platforms which are projected to provide millions of jobs and billions of dollars in revenue over the uh, coming years so according to the economists they say raising internet penetration to 75 percent of the population in all developing countries from the current level of approximately 35 percent would add an additional two trillion US to their collective GDP. That's the gross domestic product and create more than 100 billion, 140 million jobs around the world. So the argument is, is whether it's a trickle down effect or, or uh, other, otherwise, but according to the economists is the higher levels of internet penetration results in direct economic benefits. So who's doing some uh, addressing the issue? Now, uh, the ED for Research ICT Africa, it's a think tank out of, I believe it's, it's Pretoria, but it's, it's South African. Alison Gilwald, she spoke last week at the uh, IGF session. Uh, and Research I, uh, ICT Africa is a super organization. If you go to their site, you'll see uh, a number of presentations and papers that you can access on Research ICT Africa. Um, and her presentation that she did last week at the IGF, her uh, Enrique said her slideshow would be available because she has some very interesting stats on the digital inequality and injustice. Unfortunately, I did not access that in order to provide it today, but I'm, I'm assuming that her recent research on digital inequality will be posted. So I've given you the link here on Research ICT Africa, and I'm sure Sarata and, and Otis are, are quite familiar with, with her work. Okay, so I, I think what we need to, to address is the issue of what is digital divide and what is digital inclusion. And, and it basically has become a bit of a, a perspective it's it's uh, a fine line difference but it's enough to to distinguish the two now N ndia is an organization the national digital inclusion alliance they've been very very big at at pushing for home broadband access uh, whether it's urban tribal uh rural throughout the united states and they're a big advocate on public uh, broadband access. So that's free Wi-Fi uh, beyond just the libraries and, and communities, but also, um, and as I state here, it's not just access, it's also highlighting technology training, support groups, the technology in the hands of the end users. And um, as I state here, NDIA is a community of digital inclusion practitioners and advocates. Uh, and they have a, a conference once a year, and I believe it's February this year in Portland. It was canceled last year because of COVID. Um, Alfredo, how many have you gone to, one or two? Uh, I've gone to two of them. Okay, I think we were together in Charlottesville, right, last uh, year? 
Yes, yes, we were. Oh, did you go to the one in in, in Cleveland? Uh, I can't remember if it was in Cleveland, but I did go to another one. Yeah, I went to the Cleveland one. That's the 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 time when my flight got canceled. I could have driven there faster. Um, yeah, so that that was interesting. Um, let, let's talk about the four pillars that NDIA uh, deals with. They support the on the ground digital inclusion practitioners and advocates. They advocate, and 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 I've seen Angela Cipher. She's presented to FCC, a federal government. Uh, advocating for local, state, and federal policies that promote digital equity and support for local digital inclusion strategies. Um, and any of you are involved with digital strategies in your own country, I would strongly recommend uh, listening to Angela's sessions, look at their position papers. Um, do you remember, uh, Alfredo, where they were talking about the redlining in... in um, uh, I believe uh, they were talking about the redlining in, in some states where Verizon and other companies were providing internet access, but they actually, internet access was throttled. They actually was a bit of a digital divide because it wasn't high speed, even though people were paying for high speed, but it looked in optically that they were providing internet access to those communities. So there's a very good paper on redlining that uh, you might be interested in. Uh, they want to educate policymakers, uh, the media, and potential partners about the need for digital equity and to work for local digital inclusion programs. They want to conduct support and promote uh, data gathering and research that can inform the public, understanding public policy and community strategies related to digital inclusion and equity. So that's a mouthful. But uh, long story short, the, the most important thing is the uh, fellow uh, colleagues, practitioners that are willing to share the material that they have, whether on training or how they're rolling out their programs. Uh, and, and, and if you are involved with this issue of digital inclusion, you would, uh, you would not be harmed in joining their listserv and, and participating. If I may, Glenn, they, they actually uh, are a North American organization, but I, I recall that in Charlotte, I was in a session where this uh, government in, uh, person from Poland came in and joined because he was interested in, in the way uh, North America and especially the uh, National Digital Inclusion Associ Alliance was dealing with, with digital divide uh, versus the digital inclusion. So even if you are not from North America, it is worthwhile uh, if, if you have an opportunity to participate in one of their future face-to-face -face events to, to gather and do some networking with other people that may have similar issues that you have and they have found a, a workaround uh, through their network. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a good point. Uh, you never know. Um, uh, organizations like this uh, may have some fellowship or, or scholarship or something to be an intern or, uh, you know, perhaps uh, fund you to come to one of their events. So uh, do mark this down. And, and as you know, uh, we've covered everything one inch deep uh, in throughout the Internet Governance site because there's hundreds of topics in one of our roles, Alfredo and I have, is to point you in a direction where the topic we're talking about resonates with you. It's it's up your alley, whether it's on data protection or privacy, or maybe on on issues of um, you know gender politics, or it uh, or maybe you're like Charles is very interested in security, online security, and and D DNSSEC. But all we can do is one inch thick. And, and it's really up to you to find where your interest is. And, and that's why we try to encourage people as speakers who are experts in the field. And if you notice, all of them uh, come back and, and basically say, you know, please reach out to me if you have an issue or comment or if you need some help. So they've been very generous in their time. So moving forward. Okay. So this is where it gets a little complicated. When I started to, to look at this, there is not a homogeneous group that, that uh, 
there's one identified group but okay so let's look at the categories i came up with and and this is not entirely um uh the comprehensive list i'm sure one could look at another dozen uh, groups or factors so from an income disparity point of view and and some of my examples i'll give is from a north american perspective is the the income disparity groups the older adults the urban poor or or groups that um that's that has been showcased especially with ndia there's a ethnic divide so you have uh, tribal communities and in the north american case they're called north american indians or in canada first nations uh, you also have the massive number of refugees and their needs and then you have something called a gender divide which is the in in particularly in some countries uh women have less access uh for a number of reasons and young girls you also have geographical challenges so you have isolated areas like the far north of of canada or or in russia uh rural communities that are hilly or you know it's 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 you don't have the numbers to to validate putting in uh expensive infrastructure you have education as a as an issue for the digital divide about the digital literacy and especially this goes harkens back to older adults and their lack of digital literacy or the illiterate uh, then there's equipment issues, you know, accessing a computer or accessing a cell phone to access. So all of those factors identify groups or issues that that uh, address. And Bill has pointed out in, in uh, uh, cell, including both the phones themselves and the cell tower coverage, as he says. Uh, welcome, Bill. I know you were having some challenges logging in. I, I had the same problem with my desktop. I had to come in on uh, the cell phone. So it's uh, welcome to the call. Okay, income disparity. Well, let's let's address that one right off the top. Um, and I hearken back to a group called the Education Superhighway. Approximately 28.2 million of the 122.8 million households in the U.S. do not have high-speed broadband. The historic narrative has been that these households are unconnected because they do not have access to high-speed internet infrastructure. However, the reality that the 18 million of these households, home to 47 million people, are simply offline because they can't afford an available internet connection. Now, in Canada, there's a group called ACORN, and they did research in this area. And I'm actually speaking to Sarah today which is Canada's um, ISP. Um, they, they actually run the .ca, a top level domain name uh, organization. They've done a lot of, sponsored a lot of research in this area. And yeah, so if you have to decide before, um, you know, spending $200 a month on high-speed internet access versus the limited money you have from social assistance and buying food or, or medicine or whatever, uh, the, um, High-speed internet is a luxury. So um, this uh, this group called uh, Education Superhighway uh, has done quite a bit of extensive work on on broadband affordability. And uh, in my my site, internetgovernancehub.blog, if you search digital divide, you'll see a number of articles that I've I've gathered on the issue of what people were doing in order to get access to high speed since the libraries were closed for the last couple of years. Uh, again, I'll give you that link in a minute. Okay, so ethnic divide. Now, one of the groups that that were discriminated historically uh, in Europe, the Romani, or sometimes they're called historically the Gypsies, are a stigmatized minority in many parts of Europe and have a very high unemployment rate, low literacy rate, and above average exclusion from internet access. Other groups, Armenians and Kurdish communities in Turkey, uh, the illegal Hispanic community, these are people who have come across the border. Uh, you may have seen it in the newspapers, the, the children of those, those um, um, I guess, economic refugees throughout the states are trying to get US citizens, 
ship, but they're, they're, when you're dealing with certain ethnic groups, you have marginalization. And as because they're victims of, of systemic racism and exclusion, they're, they're going to suffer from a high level of um, uh, digital exclusion. Okay, another group, uh, anywhere between 10 and 15%, I, I'm, I'm seeing a range uh, on here, but not every person with a disability is poor. But I'm just pointing out that roughly 10% of the population have a disability. And according to Pew, the, Pew is uh, the internet um, research body out of Washington. Uh, Lee Rainey is one of their lead researchers. In fact, Lee will, will be part of our panel at the uh, North American School of Internet Governance coming up in a couple of weeks. And, and he reported that low income disabled individuals uh, and in fact, and you know, when you get drilled down a little deeper, low-income Hispanics or Spanish-speaking uh, disabled individuals had the highest percentage of disconnected from the states, uh, from from in the United States. The rate of internet access averaged around 52%. So, if you compare it with the non-disabled uh, persons, it's a massive number, and it's critical if you have a mobility disability or other disabilities you can't get out to do that job if you can do something remotely and if you have access to a computer it could be the difference between underemployed uh, or employed so it it, it is a, an important factor and what happens with a research like this you have people like with the ndia an advocacy group can pick this up and that's something that they can champion that cause. Okay, gender divide. Now, uh, gender divide, uh, again, is is uh, another issue, uh, very impactful on women. According to UNESCO, across 10 countries in Africa, Asia, and South America, women are 30 to 50% less likely than men to have used to the internet. And on a global level, women are 23% less likely than men to use mobile internet. Connecting those without access is often both an issue of cost as well as culture, as in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa. One gigabyte of data costs nearly 40% of the average monthly wage. And also there are other barriers to use, such as lack of literacy or acceptance. Uh, all of the factors critically impair adoption and usage. Lack of use means that one cannot access telemedicine, take an online course, digitally transform a farm, or research a school project, ultimately hindering the development and social and economic well-being, both families and community. Now, GSMA, uh, many of you have seen throughout the literature, we have a number of reports that the GSMA has done on mobile and gender, mobile and refugees, mobile, and they, they have some excellent research on the issues of um, access to phones in throughout uh, the developing countries. So um, I think we've been quite ardent in providing the links to the, um, the ebooks that we have uh, utilized from GSMA. Um, Bill asked something here. I wonder how many of the gender divide worldwide is due to the education gap for women and girls. It will be interesting to see cross tabs here. Yeah, I, I think you you got a point there uh, to ponder in terms of the education gap. And also there, especially with, as I said, with the GSMA, they they illustrate that the um, African sub, um, African uh, Sahara uh, districts had a much higher frequency and it's a cultural factor as well uh, that that impacted uh, women in, in general. I, and, and I, if I may, Glenn, uh, I invite the, the participants as well to reach out to different organizations in their communities, uh, different NGOs or non-governmental organizations, and see what they are doing to deal with the gender divide if it's an issue in their country. I know that there are some regions where there's uh, girls clubs uh, and organizations that actually deal specifically with this issue. So reach out to them. And uh, if you deem them worthwhile to mention in the uh, discussion threads that we have ongoing, uh, please do so. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, girls do code is is uh, is an example of of groups that have gotten together and 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 teaching girls coding. Uh, Black girls do code is another group I think out of um, Detroit. Uh, yeah, so you know my point is it's a lot easier to to look for examples of best practice if that's of interest for you. And uh, for example, our friend. Uh, Dev uh, uh, Anand Tilak Singh out of Trinidad, uh, he started a, a computer recycling project. He's been deeply involved with that. I I think it's mainly getting computers from from industry and uh, government, and he's refurbishing the computers and donating them to poor families. And he's done. Uh, I was talking to him on the weekend, and he's done exceedingly well. And and it was only about a year that he's been working on that and it's and it's great because when you start to to create something other people want want to be part of it so uh, people provide space volunteers come in and help refurbish reformatting hard drives or changing parts testing and then delivering the computer so and i don't think he's doing any training but then again he could provide x number of boxes to to a location <clears throat> and and provide the assistance so moving ahead okay this is um, the person i was supposed to do the session today i hope to have um her research paper um more extensively like skid row is a, a really poor section of la and um quite notorious uh in terms of um of the uh the digital and economic divide that happens in the states so she's been working with this group she's a a benton um fellow uh, as well so uh, it's we'll be keeping an eye on her project but i was hoping to have a, a more extensive um uh bit of information for you so this is what she provided to me uh so please uh when you get the slideshow you can read it in more detail So, okay, let's talk about tribal or native communities. The um, person, Soledad Mills, she works with a group called Equitable Origins. Um, Equitable Origins is part of Invenco. And I remember meeting these folks years ago at an IEEE conference with the ISO. Um, uh, no, it was an IEEE uh event where we're looking at the sustainable development goals and they've been doing some interesting projects in connectivity and she states that only four percent of the amazon indigenous community are connected interesting and and so uh, uh, according to the united states the federal agency called fcc says 628,000 tribal households lack access to standard broadband a rate more four times than the general population. And in 2019, study of the American Indian Institute found nearly one in five reservation residents has no internet at all. And what's interesting, when I visited uh, a number of homes in Northern Arizona, it was in the Hopi. Uh, Hopi is part of a group of Navajo and Apache natives in, in Arizona, and they spread further south. But not only did they didn't have internet access when I went to the homes, they didn't have any power. So they were the kids were were doing their homework on a kerosene lamp, and um, they would get one shipment, one ton of coal to heat their homes in um, in the winter from Peabody. And it's interesting because I I'm based out near Toronto, and I went there in February. And I went to this location in northern Arizona, and it was much, much colder in, in that part of the world than where I came from. I was freezing. Uh, and they kept saying, well, you're Canadian. You're used to the cold. Uh, well, uh, actually, it was, it was, it was astounding how, how you cannot have uh, Internet connectivity if you have no power. And it's, it's, it's a, a, an an overlooked concept in, in many of these projects. Uh, and again, in Canada, uh, and I talk about this a little further, uh, you know, in the high Arctic or high Northern, the internet quality varies and access suffers from 
low quality and high cost. A recent article in NPR on, on internet access in Alaska, which is similar to Northern Canada, people were paying $400 a month in, in cost. That's prohibitive for, for most people. Uh, so basically, there's serious gaps and, and the internet infrastructure is lacking in, if it'll ever get there uh, because of the lack of numbers. But the, the, all these areas within the First Nations community, uh, one, one could see the, some disparity. Um, if you notice in the slide, uh, I converted the Invenco Ecuador report so you can actually see that, see that slide. Refugees. Um, again, some very good reports by UNHCR, the UN agency which uh, is responsible for tracking and providing services to refugees. We have massive numbers, um, and again, for a number of geopolitical reasons. Uh, 79.5 million people are forcibly displaced worldwide at the end of uh, 2019. Among those were 26 million refugees, half of the age of, uh, of age 18. Uh, we're looking at there's 45.7 million internally displaced persons, 4.2 million asylum seekers, and 3.6 million Venezuelans displaced abroad. So it's different parts of the world because of politics, war, other reasons. Uh, so you have these people, you know, confined in very small places and, and uh, and, and it's not sort of a temporary thing. I remember going to Kabera in uh, Nairobi, which is the largest refugee camp in Africa. And that's been around for 20 years. We, um, we worked with a bunch of volunteers with ISOC and we were doing a point to point internet access to us, to a classroom. And what was um, unpleasant about the experience what beautiful people, uh, fantastic people. We were, they were more than pleased that we were there to help them. And so we had the technology and it was a point to point system. And um, we uh, had to do it on the second level above a uh, public latrine. So which was not a pleasant experience, but we, you know, we were up on the second level and we had to beam it to the, their main tower in order to get a point to point access for, for the um, location. Uh, long story, but uh, we uh, we were doing that in in Kybera. That was a couple of years ago. Moving forward, uh, Glenn. Uh, before you move move on, I I was wondering if you go back to the the previous slide for a second. Uh, when, when we t when you talk about refugees and and we talk about the digital divide, how yeah. about the the language barrier? Uh, these people coming into a uh, a different country, the language might be different, the, the form of communication could be different, even accessing information could be in a different language if they want to access information online. Is that true? And, and, and what information do you have regarding that? Yeah, um, I, I, you make a really good point. Um, I remember speaking at the, um, uh, with folks the, who, that were dealing with digital divide issues in California with the, they weren't refugees, they were migrant laborers that were going to California to pick the vegetables. And everybody assumed they spoke Spanish, right? They were, oh, they're Mexican, right? They all speak Spanish. Well, no, they, they were speaking their own indigenous language from parts of Mexico they came from. So the people that were trying to help them in their school or their literature, all on health issues and different health and safety issues. None of that stuff was spoken in their own languages. So yeah, I, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of good intentions, but you know, the, um, the lack of, you know, and I, Bill is on the line here and, and Bill's a part of a committee called, on universal access. He's our, he's organizing a series of, of, um, lectures that are, are going to be on universal uh, acceptance uh, that's going to be um, coming up in uh, January. Uh, Bill, do we have the link for, for the registration for that course that you're uh, organizing with ICANN? I 
and and um, Charles has his hand up. Yeah, uh, it, I don't think they they have the the link up yet, uh, Glenn. Uh, I want to address before I, I give the floor to to Charles uh, a, a comment that M Mulan makes in the chat, uh, and he mentions that if we should always make a distinction between coverage uh, synonymous to availability. And then we have another category where we talk about access in terms of device and literacy. And finally, on consumption, consumption based on affordability and adequate content. And, and it seems to be a, 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 a nice categorization of some of the uh, digital divide issues that we should uh, keep in mind. So, so thank you for that, Mulan. And if you have any additional comments, uh, Glenn? Yeah, um, I address that. Uh, what I'm just giving right now is just the categories that, that we chop up people uh, that are on the wrong side of the digital divide uh, and, and based on category. And I'll talk about it in more length on the, um, on the issues that you just addressed. But uh, maybe we can turn to Charles. Go ahead, Charles. Charles, you have the floor. I, I, I don't see your mic open. It'd be great to hear your voice, actually. This is a little more informal than our normal sessions. You guys all know me. So we are recording it, but uh, I think we can be a bit of anarchists once in a while. Well, go ahead, Glenn, and he, if he uh, enables his mic, I'll, I'll let you know. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So moving ahead, uh, and I mentioned this earlier on that that in the far northern Canada, uh, there are a small population, one percent of the population, but there's four language groups. Speaking of languages, and it's interesting because I'm learning different Cree on TikTok. Uh, there's a lady that that each day she teaches a new word, and so I'm learning bits of Cree. Now Cree is a language that's further south. It's through Northern Ontario, Ojibwa Cree, all through some of the provinces in Western Canada. But there is four distinct groups uh, and with variants on their language. And um, that's a very interesting concept on, on the, you, you know, your access to your own language on, on the Internet. And that's what Bill is involved with. He's on the committee, one of the committees on the IDNs and universal acceptance. But I, I am pretty sure they they've uh they have a link to that registration uh so if anybody's interested in taking that universal acceptance course we'll post it in the discussion thread uh as well but maybe uh maybe one of us will stumble across it uh, uh before we finish today okay so this is the what what uh Mulud was talking about uh usage affordability financial viability infrastructure and and all coming together to be a sustainable uh, a project. So let's talk about affordability to start with. Affordability uh, ensures that connectivity service uh, user pricing falls within a given affordability uh, threshold. One of the rule of thumbs that um, people call affordable is that 2% of the monthly GNI per capita for one gigabytes of mobile broadband. So, so there is a yardstick that's available in order to say, okay, this is affordable. And it's gotta be relative, right? Uh, to where you are. So, you know, and to, to make it affordable, you, one has to look at a variety of different means to make it happen. Uh, for example, the, the project that, that Facebook uh, announced last week at the IEEE event, which brings Africa with with cable, and it says it has 43 access points around the continent, but it didn't go into detail. You know, what would that cost? Who will access it, and and, and will that access percolate down to the end users on the people we're talking about? The second thing is usage. Um, the usage well identifies the applications and services that need to be available for the locality and the local language. And that's what we were talking about. The digital literacy, the user perceived value, 
uh, all of this is is part of the analysis. You know, it's no point putting something in place that without someone taking the time to find out what the uh, the needs of the community are. Uh, the other issue is financial viability. Financial viability measures the economic viability for private investment, and that could be a private public venture. And they basically look at the backhaul, they look at the middle mile connectivity issues. And so you have to, from a business point of view, does it make sense? You know, it you, you could, everyone could have internet access, but at what price? So uh, companies tend to, I think it's part of their DNA, they were very, very concerned about how, uh, get a return on investment. So there's, the, it has to be a viable uh, project for them. Or like in what we're seeing with the FCC in the States, massive infusion of cash by the federal government in order to make it happen. Okay, infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure involves, um, you know, some kind of service del delivery model and identifying any current policy, as I stated, or regulatory constraints that for the model to be implemented. So if in your country they don't allow community networking, you know, that has to, you know, one has to address the policy changes to allow that. Uh, and so that all gets bundled together under a term called sustainability. That's the middle of this puzzle. And what we have is a service model, a, a revenue model that works for everybody. You have a policy and regulation, uh, environment that extends the connectivity to the unconnected uh, which can involve you know innovative financing it can be special licensing it could be tax alleviation uh, or it could be you know so maybe adopting new technology like tv white space and the experiments that i've seen in in jamaica and elsewhere uh, but it could be uh, a whole raft of things but one of the most important things if they put it in place, you know, hiring local people, local, local trained people to maintain the system. The last thing you want to see is something put in place and, and the, the nice people came and popped it in and they went away and it goes to rack and ruin because there isn't any local talent to maintain it. So that is the pieces of the puzzle. In order to get the last mile solution, everything just has to be right uh, so that that uh, it can actually work, not just for the companies and the government, but the people that are the that will use the service. If I may, Glenn, uh, the uh, the Internet Society uh, has uh, uh, some initiatives towards uh, creating uh, community networks, and they actually have uh, some briefings, some reporting papers that you can look at uh, that give you an idea of how to, to develop and implement one of these uh, uh, these projects. Uh, keeping in mind the five pieces that Glenn just mentioned in the previous uh, slide. So I invite you to go into the uh, Internet Society website, especially the ISOC Foundation, and looking into the different opportunities they, they have. If you have a local chapter in your country as well, uh, it would be great to reach out to them and see how you can work together in one of these initiatives. Uh, Glenn, back to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Alfredo. I actually talk about that in a second. Um, so this, this, I just want to share with you uh, very quickly. These are some of the things that are coming up. Uh, if you're interested in digital inclusion and divide, the NASIG event is there's a registration link. Uh, the IGF Poland always has a section. Uh, on there's a DC coalition of community networking. If you're interested in that, you can join that group. Uh, that will be virtual. So you can actually attend those sessions and join those. Uh, and then I mentioned a couple of times about net inclusion and that's a link to the registration. So moving forward. So some of the government initiatives I, I've referred to, the FCC is pumping in $3.4 billion throughout the state. So you have that, those tribal locations that are, or, or 
urban or rural locations that which probably would never get the high speed internet access, but the FCC policy is going to enable groups to be able to do that. You have a UN broadband commission, you have the EU digitally uh, strategy. You have the African Union digital strategy. You have the Latin American and Caribbean IXP strategy. You have the Asia World Bank and the Canadian digital strategy as examples. And all of these are links when you um, when you see the ebook. Um, Alfredo, would you mind popping the ebook into the the chat? And each of those links will work, and you can read up more if you're a person that's really quite interested in influencing government initiatives and policies this is the way to do it now recently canadian digital strategy was a little goofy on in terms of the the social media strategy so the internet society with other agencies made some strong statements in order to make that um, for the government uh folks to rethink that strategy Okay, so we just said a second ago about community networkings. This is a link to the ISOC community networks. You can see uh, the things that they've done. Uh, I've been involved for 10 years with the IEEE Humanitarian Activities Committee and CITE. I'm the chair of the Toronto CITE, which is the special interest group on humanitarian technology. So you could look at, at them. They did... Um, um, maximum $5,000 funding uh, for COVID, they'll do that funding again. Uh, so I reviewed, oh God, uh, at least 100 proposals. Uh, Alfredo helped me last year. We must have done half of the, the proposals we reviewed. Some great proposals. Um, most of them were from India and, and Africa. Uh, one was from North America, one from Guatemala. But generally speaking, the HAC and site proposals that come in, are from those two locations. Uh, NetHope has done some fantastic work. Uh, there's a guy named Drury has done some great work. He, um, well worth uh, looking at what NetHope has done. Association of Progressive Communication, ABC. Uh, again, Alliance for Affordable Internet. Uh, the Meta, Meta uh, or Facebook, formerly known as Facebook, uh, spoke last week at the, um, at the IEEE meeting talking about what stuff they're doing. And I mentioned about the cable service that they're going, wrapping Africa, uh, the Microsoft Airband projects and the GSMA TV white space. Project. All of these are examples of what the business or not-for-profits have tried to roll out in terms of digital divide issues. So uh, again, um, that should be non-government best practice, not no government best practice. Uh, there's the link directly to the APC. Uh, and again, um, the, the, you know, these organizations are very open in terms of critical feedback on what they've done. Uh, Jane Coffin uh, was one of our speakers at our event, uh, I think Group B, uh, Alfredo. Uh, so you can go back and listen to her lecture. Um, there was a community networking conference that ISOC did a couple of years ago in Kenya, but they've done it, I think, virtually every year. Uh, do If you're interested in getting involved with IEEE, uh, there's the link to the IEEE Humanitarian Committee. And this is one of the most interesting, and I could probably do an entire lecture just on GoFi. This is the uh, group out of Spain on, on community networking. Uh, this is a very large scale project. And again, it's part of their culture. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, community projects. Um, so you know, they, they're very famous for, for co-ops. And, and uh, so lo look at the GoFi project, and I gave you the link for that. Resources. Um, again, here's a, a few resources for you to, to look at um, that you may be interested in. So, and this is something that, IEEE did last year. Uh, if you're interested in doing a project, you may be uh, interested in connecting with uh, IEEE. This is the video that uh, you can watch on which which organizations uh, got funded. So again, if you're interested in, in rolling out a project in your own country, you may want to consider looking at who, who, uh, who was shortlisted. Uh, again, uh, and I, and I cannot, 
underestimate the importance of power. And IEEE um, project that we implemented a number of years ago was uh, a solar trailer system in Haiti. And that was a battery exchange system, very small, one, one kilowatt, or maybe it was a five kilowatt system, I can't remember. But 22 people in this village uh, got signed up and each day they get a new battery and they exchange it twice a day and it gave them basic power, uh, power to get for lighting and, and powering, charging their cell phones. Cause they were in, in these, this village in, in Haiti, they were paying a dollar a day just for charging their cell phones from the neighborhood store. Um, so if, if you are looking at putting a community networking in place, uh, do consider very strongly what kind of power system you'll have. And in addition to that, securing the system. You, the last thing you wanna do is have it walk away. Uh, as what happened with Engineers Without Borders in Haiti, they put a nice system in place and by the time they came back, all the copper was stolen. Uh, so one has to be conscious of that. Um, so there's some very interesting stuff, but what we gave you here is a guidebook on how to set up your community networking manual. Okay, so that wraps me up. Uh, so as you know, this is standard stuff. So uh, over to you, Alfredo. Uh, yes, I'm looking for questions. If you have any questions, uh, uh, raise your hand or or write it in the chat so that I can share it with, with Glenn. Uh, in, in the meantime, Glenn, uh, how, how do you see a digital divide or digital inclusion in the next five years in terms of getting uh, more people connected that are not connected to broadband? Yeah, I think we're having a change in, in you know, terminology. I think the, the term digital divide will probably be disappearing because uh, it sort of has a negative connotation uh, associated with. And, and everyone I've talked to that's deeply involved with us, they don't like the other terms as well. So that, that might be something we'll see is a change of phraseology as we as we evolve uh, uh on the language uh but i i you know we're seeing some real moves uh but you know the, the it's a matter of philosophy if we treat internet access the same as we treat power or water uh as a public asset and that it should be part of the the, the public interest and everyone should have access uh, as any other the public roads or else, um, and and people have, have voiced opinion that broadband is a human right. Um, so it's a philosophical shift, uh, uh, and it's a question of, you know, what are we doing uh, in order to assist those individuals to get access? And and I think it's a wholesale change in attitude that needs to happen, and. Um, you know, I'll give you a good example, and I, I know it sounds a little quirky example, but, you know, we had um, in California, uh, Bob, uh, Bill could probably relate to this, a real serious water shortage. And so how could they prompt homeowners to change their toilets and, and water saving devices? And what they came up with as a solution, they said to contractors, you go door to door, you change people's toilets for nothing, you know, so they have no reason not to do it. They get a brand new water efficient toilet and other devices and shower heads, and various different things, and they get credits. And so that allows them to go and get building permits from their municipality. So there's an example of, of a clever way to have a, you know, a, a business intervention for a public good. Because, you know, the water saved because of those interventions were substantial. And so, you know, what's it cost? Well, it basically is, you know, education of those contractors and making it when they came said, okay, here's my plans. I need a permit to build this house. Well, do you have any water, water credits? No. Well, get your staff knocking on doors, you know, and it, it was quite proactive. Uh, so I, yeah, in my view, we got a long way to go. We still have 
a substantial number of people. And we're not talking an 80 20 rule. We're still talking massive number of people. We may get some minor access to a lot more people to give them the level of internet access that is in Singapore or United States or whatever. I think that's going to be tough. Um, I, I think the balance between affordability and financial payback to companies, enough money from whether it's UN agencies or, or not for profits, there's limited money uh, out there. So I think it's going to be a real challenge. The, the thing is where the, the areas where individuals uh, are not going to have an intervention, there's no government uh, monies. Some communities need to take it on themselves and create a community network, which has been done. Uh, communities, and, and there's good examples, I believe the, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about the solution that's in Argentina, the Libra Router uh, group out of Argentina has done some very interesting stuff. And what it is, is they take it upon themselves with sweat equity, they build their own towers, they get people to sign up, and it's a cost-effective way to give people in that small community access. And what's critical too is they teach people how to maintain the system. So that that I think is is going to be needed. I think we'll need to roll out a lot more community empowerment, where communities own the community networks. They are responsible for it. They may just need a little cash infusion in order to to get it to, to work. Um, there's a guy named Pullen uh, who's done some interesting stuff in the states where they, they don't philosophically believe giving handouts. It's a payback approach might work, um, but I, I don't think there's one solution. Uh, so, Serato, you say interesting projects here in Ghana, okay, on connectivity. It's still not easy and quite expensive broadband, right? Uh, any lead to organization will support digital education, especially with focus on young women in STEM or entrepreneurship. Excellent. Yeah, I think the content is is another element in this, is that you have to have stuff online that's relevant and current and good quality uh, so that people get value. Uh, and again, it's the killer apps, right? So uh, back to you, Alredo. Uh, well, I, I don't see any more questions. We're reaching the top of the hour. Uh, so just to s give back some time to the participants, I want to thank you, Glenn, for uh, stepping up uh, at the last moment and, and getting this together so that we can learn something, uh, some more details and some insight on the digital divide versus the digital uh, inclusion. Uh, a, a heads up for everybody. Uh, one of the sessions we're going to have in NASIC 2021 is going to precisely touch on on these two concepts, the digital divide versus the digital inclusion. And we're going to have a, a, a nice uh, panel discussing that. Uh, we are also going to have another session where the tribal communities will have an important say in, in, in their approach to getting connected the unconnected in their uh, communities as well. So uh, if you are really interested in NASIC 2021, register, it's free, it's online, uh, two half days. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to exchange and hear uh, insights from different uh, sectors of the civil society and some uh, non-governmental organizations as well. Uh, so so Glenn, uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you again for this. I want to thank the participants for sharing and being with us. Remember that next week's session is a 90-minute session. It's going to be very interesting, so I invite you all to, to participate. Uh, thank you, Glenn. And uh, having said that, uh, this session is adjourned. Thank you all.